Seder. That's the easy Passover. It's the getting ready beforehand. That's the hard Passover. That's when you really taste the taste of slavery. Especially if you live in a house which is ground zero for hummus, right? And so we used to clean and clean and clean and unwinter everything and get everything ready. And it was a big deal. Making Pesach in Yiddish is machin Pesach, right? That's three quarters of the holiday. By the time the Seder comes, you're already like home free. Easy. So tonight is part of that process of making Pesach. Tonight we're going to get ready for the Passover by thinking about some of the ways that we can enrich this special holiday. You've been getting the little things on your phone? Yeah. Yes. The so the, 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 the people yes. most responsible for that are Rabbi Farkas and Alana, Alana Borspen and Alana Zimmerman. So if you see them, give them a hug. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. And in fact, tonight, in, in honor of the uh, new technology that has come to rule American life, uh, we're being live streamed on, uh, Facebook. on Facebook. So there are seven Jews the world over who are watching that. Because they couldn't sleep in South Africa or France. We saw you in Puerto Vallarta when you opened the door. Puerto Vallarta, right? We saw us in Puerto Vallarta. So tonight what we're going to do is exactly what those videos are. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna divide the evening into a group of uh, short presentations by some of the teachers and presenters at the synagogue. And, uh, and in between, you'll get a little comic relief from me, a little chance to say hello and enjoy the holidays. So let's begin the way we begin at all our holidays. Everybody stand up, turn around and say, Hot Samach, welcome.
questions for meaning in the holiday. There are many numbers that we find throughout the Seder. The first obvious number is that there are 15 steps to the Seder, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But when you think of numbers in the Seder, immediately your number should jump to the fours. There's four cups of wine, there's four children, there's ten plagues, there's four questions. Let's call these the evens for a few moments. Now the evens are a part of every aspect of the Seder, and the rabbis were very careful to choose numbers for the way that we would observe the holiday because they wanted to project a sense of balance. When you look at the fours of the Seder, and you ultimately read about the ten plagues, which the rabbis, if you read a traditional Seder, will begin to even play with that number and say that there weren't ten plagues, but there were forty plagues, or there were fifty plagues, or there were even two hundred and fifty plagues. So in they're playing with these numbers, they're trying to create a sense of balance. And just think about it. The four cups of wine represent a journey that we're meant to take. It's taken from the Greek symposium, a way in which the Greek thinkers of the day would gather together for a special meal and discuss an interesting subject. And it was punctuated by four cups of wine. When the rabbis were thinking about how should the Jewish people commemorate this grand story of who we are and where we're yet to go, they modeled it after the great Greek philosophers of their day and said, four cups of wine is a way that we're going to tell our story. And they likened it to all different kinds of texts which support the number four. That the four cups of wine relate to the four different ways that God redeemed the Israelites, as you read in the book of Exodus. Or look at the four questions. We know that in the Talmud it tells you that there are certain things that are intended to be asked. We can play around, actually, if you see, that may very well be one question, but we have interpreted it to have three additional questions that are a part of it. On all other nights, we eat leavened bread, but on this night, we eat matzah. On all other nights, we eat all kinds of food, but tonight, we eat mahor. On all other nights, we eat we eat whatever we like, but we eat carpot, something fresh. And on all other nights, we eat upright, but on this night, we eat reclining to rejoice. When we do that, that idea of balance is something that the rabbis are trying to connect with us. That's why we tell a story about the four children. Why four children? Why not three children? Why not five children? In fact, the Chabad Lubavitcher Rebbe always teaches that there's an additional one, a fifth child the one who's not at the Seder table, to teach us that even though there's a sense of balance, maybe there's a little bit balance. We'll come back to that in just a moment. And of course, 10 plates. Now, it's not that we talk about it in words of media. You can see it in pictures. So let's go. Here's some very interesting pictures about four children. I love this one, because look at the picture itself. You have different colors and different kinds of internal experiences. So part of the balance is not that each one complements each other, but that there are, there's a, a diversity, there's a plurality in four that we may not be able to fully appreciate with three alone. Well, look at this one. We had a couple years ago, we had Alfred Schick come, and we had Alfred Schick's artwork displayed on our hallway. This is from his Haggadah. You can't see it very well, but you get to see it. And then, of course, you know, there's these four guys who maybe you'll see, and you know, the question is, who was the wise one, and who was the wicked one, and who was the one who was uh, too alive. simple to ask, you know, so we'll play that game for another day. And you know, all different kinds of art, it's hard to see, but look at this, this is about as um, crafty as my children, these are the ten plagues, look at this frog, all the way to the death of the firstborn, and the way of, of representing these graphically helps us to understand as well this sense of balance. Now, on the other side, there are plenty of numbers that don't have 
even connections. In fact, there are several that are incomplete. The odds of the counting of the holiday. So we know that the holiday always begins on the 15th of Nisan, which is going to be Monday night this year. We know that that's likened to 15 steps in the Seder, which I suppose we can sing the song, keep it in mind as we move forward in our study for the next few moments. There's the 15 steps of Dainu. I know we did in our Haggadah what we did with Rabbi Feinstein just a moment ago, but if you look in a traditional Haggadah, there are 15 unique and individual moments in which we say, if this hadn't happened to us, then we would not have experienced the taste of freedom as fully and completely as it's been given to us. And so we say, Dayenu. If only one of those things was given to us. Dayenu. Now there's something that I didn't include on this list which makes it even more remarkable. At the temple in Jerusalem, there used to be songs that were recited as the priests would ascend the steps leading into the main temple plaza to offer the sacrifices on behalf of the community. There are exactly 15 steps from the bottom to the top of that area. Has anybody been to the southern steps in Jerusalem where Robinson's Arch is? Next time you're there, you'll count and you'll try to see which one of those 15 steps are there. All of this is to connect to us not only that it's a simple play with numbers, because in truth, we could say that the Jewish people, the rabbis, had a little bit of an obsession with numbers. We could say that. But there is this other sense that when numbers are out of sync, the pairs are not complete, that the sense of imbalance actually opens up for us the tremendous and powerful conversation of what is yet complete in our lives. That's the story the rabbis want us to tell. So you can compare the numbers that are even in balance with the numbers that are in balance, and you see not only that there is so much more that is out of step, but it also opens up the opportunity for us to have that great conversation of what is yet complete and what is yet unfold in our soul. So look, there's the three symbols that we eat on the Seder plate that no Passover Seder is complete without. The Pesach, the Passover sacrifice, or the, the Shankon, which uh, we we can sometimes replace in our day with an orange or a tomato or a pea. A matzah and a maror. These are all things that we're supposed to partake in. And then, of course, the last one, Echad Miyodea, who knows one? That's a little picture of Diana. <laughs> and this is a beautiful Haggadah. This is the Agam Haggadah. You can't read it, but if you spend a lot of time, look up where I say you see one, two, three, four, and it goes all the way up to 13. And I leave us with, with this one when it comes to counting, because the question that I was thinking about in presenting all of this wonderful connection that you can draw from the numbers of the Seder with the idea that these numbers, with this idea that we have so many numbers in our Seder is only meaningful if you can connect with what? So why four cups? Why 15? Why all the steps? It's not so that we have a way to accomplish the goal of telling the story alone. It's so that we can open up that conversation to one who makes it, one who matters. That in our county, it's not just the, the total sum of what our Seder has for us, but how does it affect us as individuals, or even better, how does it affect the person who is joining us at the Seder? And that's why I hope that as your Seder begins for you and this holiday emerges, that you go through these numbers and you ask yourself the question of who is not sitting at your table, and who would you like to be sitting there, and how will they be counted? I want to leave you with one other wonderful counting opportunity as your Seder began. I'll be doing this at my Seder table. Have you ever heard of this? It's called Six Word Memoirs. No. So think of this. Mm -hmm. Try to come up with some way to encapsulate the Seder in six words. Let me give you a few examples. Six Word Memoirs. Only a Jew.
Jewish boy, Mom said. We spent our budget on love. One small Jew, one loud family. Old woman comes just for huge. That never happened in Valley Vegetable. <laughs> Passover food coma. Again next year. Leftover Passover eggs? Colored for Easter. And this year that can be true. And then the last one, which uh, in playing with, with uh, my friends and telling them that we're going to present, let my people go, let's eat. That's seven. Take out now and say, let's eat. However you count your numbers, whatever steps of the Seder then become meaningfully for you throughout the holiday, not only is it beautiful in its structure and its architecture, but the important message is you to take away in this holiday is how does each of us count? Where will you count as this holiday begins? Where is your number among the many numbers of the Jewish community and the Jewish world that is celebrating this holiday today? And when you discover that, I hope that through one, you find your way to the delightful, colorful, myriad of meanings and connections Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, I announced before, and I want to make sure you all know, there's a contest going on. You can all enter. It's the most remarkable Passover product contest. This contest started five years ago, and the very first winner was our dear teacher and mentor, Rabbi Schulweiss, who came back from New York with it for his with kosher for Passover lipstick for his wife. <laughs> she was not amused, but we let him have the award anyway. The second year was won by our friend Murray Miller. He brought us kosher for Passover fettuccine Alfredo. <laughs> Just like our ancestors ate in the land, right? The third year was run by my father, my former son-in-law, who brought me a bag of gefilte fish flavored gummy bear candy. <laughs> Guaranteed to keep any Ashkenazi child quiet at your table. Um, last year, last year was won by our dear friend Rabbi Matt Rutta, who grew up in the synagogue in Gatsunika, and is now a rabbi in Texas, and he sent us a carton of Ben and Jerry's Haroset flavored ice cream. <laughs> that won. Now this year, I had a couple of entries which are promising. The first one was the manager at Supersol, and I'm going to film there the other night, handed me two bottles of kosher for Passover beer. And my wife, Nina, was at Cambridge Farms this afternoon and texted me a picture of a package of kosher for Passover pizza. So the Feinstein family is going to enter pizza and beer for Pesach. The other one, which I'm not sure we can accept as an entry, I have to check with the judges because it's not food, but it is a Passover product. It is a kosher for Passover toilet seat cover. You, you slip it over your toilet seat. It looks like a matzah. And on the toilet seat, it says, let my people go. <laughs> That's promising, but it's not food. So you can enter the contest if you find a Passover food at the supermarket, and it makes you say, oh, wow. Take a picture on your phone, send it to me, and you too can be immortalized. The Valley Central Pesach Hall of Fame. In the Mishnah, we are taught that you are to tell the Seder story to everyone at the table according to their ability. So tonight, we'd like to know how we involve small children in the telling of the Seder. We'd like to welcome Abby Mars, who is our ECC director, the newest member of the community. <laughs> So I want to spend just a few minutes uh, this evening and talk specifically about, can you hear me or not? Not enough. Okay. No one's ever accused me of being shy or quiet. <laughs>
talk a little bit about engaging not only young children, but young families and folks who feel young at heart in the Seder. And the, the, the sort of framework for, for my few minutes is the Hunger Games, is it dinner yet? Because all of us have found ourselves in the position, particularly on the second night of Seder, right? Where you look at your watch and think, the filter fish never seemed so far away. <laughs> And if you can imagine that for yourself as an adult, you can only imagine how fidgety little ones may be feeling at a dinner table when it's far past their bedtime, their shoes are too tight, and they're really, really hungry for something that they don't see on the table. But the job is important, and not just important, but it's critical, because after all, they are the ones who will be leading satyrs in many years uh, to come. And so our responsibility as the adults, as the models in the room, is to engage and to teach and to model. And so I, I want to talk about this uh, for just a minute. Um, to learn and to teach and to keep and to do. And that is an idea fitting for Passover, fitting for our satyrs, and fitting for the work that I do with young children and committed teachers all year long. Our job is to have children understand ritual, understand their history, understand the continuity and the role they play in being a Jew. And in order to do that, they need to listen. They need to hear songs. They need to hear songs of freedom. They need to hear songs from their grandparents and that of the person next to them who comes from another country. They need to learn through experience, through touching, through doing, through seeing. And they need to safeguard our most precious obligation of continuing Judaism. Um, something that I feel that is really at the heart of the work that we do here at BBS. And because we're talking about children, they do need to do that in ways that feel active. Um, all that in order to learn Torah and to learn it with love, both head and heart. So if you look at all of these things, you understand what, how important they are, not only for the Passover Seder, but all year through. And particularly when we talk about small children, the importance it plays there. So let's just talk a minute about the Seder. And what a fitting opportunity for young children this holiday is. Because it's all about sensory explanation, uh, exploration. And research tells us that children learn and retain information and are ready for more information when they understand through senses. So think for a minute about your own experiences around the Seder table and offer up some examples to the group uh, about how taste in the Seder helps to concretize the ideas. What, what is that something we do around the Seder table in terms of taste that would help, help children learn? What's that? Masa, right? The crunch of that masa, the feel of it in your hand, it feels different and it tastes different than ordinary bread. So imagine yourself as a three-year-old making the connection, this masa feels different than waffles. <laughs> what about hearing? What, uh, what resonates when you think about the Passover Seder? If you were a child or as an adult, what do you hear and how do you know it's Passover? Song. Yeah, be more specific. Yeah, singing, manashtana, right? Literally the words echoing in our ears, this night is different. How is this night different, right? What about touching? We know little ones like to touch. How does the Seder allow us to do that? Parsing the salt water, yeah. right? It's active, it's doing, we're touching. Um, and we know kids like that, like to do that, and it's an opportunity to connect actively with the Seder. What about visually? What about seeing? What's happening there? Yeah, yeah. The beautiful, the beautiful ritual um, items on the table, right? Clearly, clearly a message that this is a night that feels different than Tuesday pizza. Yeah, what were you going to say? Sitting around the table with little family together without having Right. The sense, of, the sense of community and safety, sitting together, the leaning perhaps, right? All things that young children can, can understand. The Seder play. The 
cedar plate. What about it? Well, it has all the things that are on it are different. Right. They're, right. they're specific to that holiday. So the ultimate symbol for us of, of, of this night being different from all other nights. Absolutely. And then what about the last? Feeling, but not touching, but really feeling and making connection between head and heart. Because for young children, this is what we really hope for them. If they can, if they can spell, great. If they can count, good. But if they can make connections between head and heart by the time they walk out of the ECC, our job is done. So how do we do that around the Seder table? Head and heart. The story of the slavery yeah. and our love. Right, right, an opportunity to develop empathy, absolutely, yeah. Well, at, at uh, my Seder's growing up, uh, the connection between what was going on in the world and, and, and the Seder and what had gone on. Absolutely. And, you know, very, that was, that was the heart of the Seder. Right, right, that which is historical, that which is current and happening now, and the idea that there is a future, which we may not be able to explain, but the connection of the three, absolutely. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I would say the cup of Elijah, opening up the door and welcoming the stranger. Yeah, yeah. And I, I remember feeling a little, always a little bit nervous, right? A little bit scared, and yet also thrilled by the opportunity to open that door. Um, and that's the world for children, right? It's thrilling and a little bit scary all at once. Right? Yeah. To feel the head and the heart, what it is like to be a slave. Right. To actualize yourself as another um, and put yourself in that place. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, so I want to just touch on this idea too. Thank you, thank you for those ideas. Um, and I, I think we, we touched on it just before, talking about feeling um, and understanding who you are in connection to other people. And often, um, in the ECC, we talk about creating rituals for young children that help them feel safe, that help them to predict what might come next so that they can become owners of their own environment, um, they can be invested in a way beyond just what their teachers have created for them. And um, part of that ritual is often what we call morning circle. And morning circle happens about a half an hour or so after the day begins. And it's an opportunity for children and adults in the classroom to share something interesting about the evening that has passed, something that they're anticipating um, that will happen uh, later in the day, a concern they have, a leak they picked up from the parking lot to the classroom. And I think this idea that listening to other people's stories while being able to share your own is also at the heart of the Passover experience. And so that is one of the other ideas as we um, are thinking about programs and curriculum for young children in the preschool, that is always at the heart of, of what we're doing. And I, I encourage you to think about ways to really expand that notion at your own theaters um, this, this coming week. I want to leave you with a, a, per, a personal um, um, reference. Um, I, I come from a really wonderful um, and interesting and complicated family. Um, a few of you may, may know them as well. And um, they are deeply connected to this idea of ritual. Oops, wrong way. Uh, deeply committed to this idea of ritual and continuity. And so um, when I was much, much, much younger, uh, my parents decided that no Haggadah really satisfied the need that they wanted. They celebrated, we celebrated with a Haggara, um, and they decided that they would create their own. And over 30 years, they added and pulled and um, revised and took notes. And you can see this is not a great looking document, but it is a living document, literally a living document. So much so that there is page 13A, 13B, 13C, 13D, 13E and a half, which I don't really understand, but it seems and part of the beauty um, of the Sangata was the opportunity for children to be involved. And so from a young age, there was an opportunity for all children to own the front cover. And I want to share with you just a few of these covers. These are all from my own family, Sangata. Um, and I also have, and I'll leave if you happen to be interested, 
about 18, 20 years worth of Haggadah covers in this notebook. I just um, pulled a few for us to take a look at today. Um, this is one from a couple of years ago. Um, I am a slave. And you see, we were talking about um, having your Seder be current and relevant. No guessing what, what that's about. Here's one that's also topical. Uh, these are the Power Rangers. This is a Haggadah produced in 2006. Um, and I believe it was my oldest son who put that together. He must have really been invested in the Power Rangers, the idea of good and evil, right? Um, there's the idea that uh, Rabbi Hoffman was talking about before. We have four different Power Rangers there. Uh, this was one um, that I think we, we all remember well. Um, but I think it doesn't need explanation. Yeah. Uh, a self-portrait. This is by my now 16-year-old son. 2005, he produced it. I'm happy because I am free. And that is a boy who is free. And I'll leave you with this one. This is one I made when I was 11. <laughs> Let my people go. And um, I cannot tell you the experience it is to watch my own children sort through the Haggadah that we still use today uh, with my own three children and our own extended Haggadah as they flip through the pages of those front covers to see what was, wonder what will be, and to figure out their own place in the Seder and in the Jewish world. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yay. Part of the Seder is singing some songs, so we brought some musical experts with us. Anyone here on Friday night, last Friday night? Yes. A beautiful Sephardic service. Marvelous service led by uh, our musician in residence, Andrew Levy. And uh, tonight we marry the Ashkenazic tradition of uh, land to fill the fish with the spicy Sephardic tradition of, uh, of Rabbi Le of, of, of Elisha Levy, together with Kenner Phil Barron, for some Pesach music from both sides of the Jewish world. You ready, guys? Just about, please. <coughs> so some years ago, I was listening to the radio, and I heard the mayor of Skokie, Illinois, speaking. And she was saying, you know, people don't realize what a diverse place Skokie is. And the interviewer said, oh yes, it's very, very diverse in scope. You've got Jews from Russia, Jews from Poland, <laughs> Jews from Lithuania. It's diverse. Uh, I feel a little bit like that. I think most of us in this room uh, would be described as one of those places. But there are a lot of other places. So if you're a Jew from Iraq or Syria or Morocco uh, or Turkey or Greece, you may have a little bit different tradition. And we don't get to hear those traditions very often. Even though the words are right there in our Haggadah, sometimes the melodies might be a little bit different. So Asher is going to share a melody with us right now, uh, the words you may be familiar with. Oh, mi padre, por dos 
So they made up their own. So that inspired me to think about if I were to make up a bracha for the candles, what would it be? And we sing this at our Seder every year. Lights of freedom burning bright, giving off your sacred life. Say Let 
everybody and hearing such beautiful melodies to the Passover songs. At the day school, when we are teaching about Jewish experiences, 
We are always looking for a balance between teaching the ritual and making it personal in some way. And when we come to the Passover Seder, there are so many beautiful rituals, and it lends itself to so much learning that can take place. But how do you actually make those rituals personal? I'd like to know, first of all, who's leading a Seder in their home? Leading a Seder? Um, who's leading a Seder for the first time? Who's going to somebody else's home for a Seder? <laughs> who's actually going on a cruise to a Seder and putting their feet up and enjoying it? Well, you've just told us a story based on your own hand. Hands can tell a story. And when we're looking to create a connection with the Passover Seder, we want to focus in on some aspect that can make it personal. So what's in a hand? What do we learn from a hand? When we tell the story, we begin by talking about reliving the experience as if we were slaves in Egypt. Well, how do we do that? We start off by trying to figure out freedom from. Freedom from what? We have to ask that question and to be able to make that connection. And that's a conversation you can have at your Seder table. Freedom from what? And as we're looking at the story of the Israelites, we can also look at our own personal story. Is there something that we want to become free from? Are there people in the world that are not free now? But if they're not free, what is the goal? We're moving towards what? And this is just an important part of the story. Because the Seder takes us on a journey. So we are looking at what is behind that journey. So freedom from, freedom to. And what is that pivotal point that makes the difference of being able to take that step from slavery to freedom? Well, it tells us in the Haggadah. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm. Everybody say that. A strong hand and an outstretched arm. Well, where does this come in the Haggadah? Right after Manishana. We've just asked the four questions. So this is the answer. It comes right after that. When we talk about Abedim Hainu, we were slaves. And God took us out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. So it's very visual. You're just, you know, you can just picture it as it's happening. Well, is it that simple? Does God just come out of the sky and point God's finger and all of a sudden the slavery is over? Because if it was that simple, we wouldn't have the whole Seder, the Haggadah, all of history, if, if it was just a, a matter of God reaching out, it would be a very short story, wouldn't it? So we have to ask the question, what does this phrase really mean? And what does it compel us to think about as we're going through the Seder? So we think about what is the role of a hand? And there are all different types of Haggadot which have beautiful pictures in them. And these hands, in these pictures, are very symbolic. So this comes from a Haggadah, and this is Jacob blessing his grandchildren, um, Ephraim and Menasha. Well, this is what we do at the beginning of our Seder, we bless our children. So what is the role of hands in this picture? They are blessing hands. So hands can make a difference. These are blessing hands. This is from the Maxwell House Haggadah. <laughs> this is a grandma there hugging her children, honoring her grandchild and showing a lot of love at the Seder. In this picture, we see hands take on a very different role. Hands can also be harmful. So where at first our hands were blessing, now we're saying that hands can also be ones that can cause harm to others. The taskmaster, the hard labor that our slaves endured. And this is a child reaching out who is hungry. This hand tells a story. For all who are hungry, 
from an eat. And this hand is pointing towards hope and freedom. There are choices to be made in the use of our hands, but there also takes leadership in how we move freedom from and freedom to. And finally, when we get to the end of our story and the sea parts, and Miriam leads in joyous song, those hands are hands of freedom and, and joy. So these hands tell a story. So how does this relate to our Seder, and what can we do to make that personal connection? Well, first of all, when we get to this phrase in the Haggadah, we can ask the question, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, whose hand is that? Is it God's hand? Is it the people's hand? Is it Moses' hand? Is it Miriam's hand? Is it our hands? Is it a partnership between human beings and God? And Rabbi Showais taught us that story, that in order for God to make a difference in our world, that we have to join in with God as a partner. And I think that, that image really stays with us as we talk about the meaning of the Seder for us today. Because if it's only a story about the finger coming from the sky, then the story really doesn't have that much to do with us, and we don't really have a role. We can hope, and we can hope that God will intervene, but I think really making it come alive is telling our own personal stories in relation to this. So, finally, this is where it comes together. The hands are an opportunity to bring shalom, and shalom is complete with but shalom cannot just be one-sided. It has to be working together. What are those stories that we can tell that represent that? So at the Seder, there are a number of things that you can do with hands. You can talk about whose hand is it, God's hand, human hand, working together. You can ask everybody at the table, every time you see a hand in the Haggadah, what does that hand represent? And what does that mean today? You can also ask everybody to raise their hand and talk about a way that they can be a partner with God to help bring freedom to others or help to be, whether that's somebody in the community, somebody in the world, or even in our homes. How can a hand be a helping hand? How by just helping do the dishes for a child, does that help bring freedom for the parents in the home? They don't have to do all the work themselves. So you can make it very tangible. But this isn't just about young children. This is about each one of us seeing the role that we have in this bigger story. So I was very fortunate a week ago that a group of grandparents came to the day school and we had the opportunity to do this lesson together with grandparents and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And after they, and they learned about all the different hands and the possibility of what hands can do, they made a matzah cover together. And this is something that you can do, very simple. Four pieces of felt, glue the corners, a place for three matzahs to fit inside. But the beauty of this is that the conversation that took place between the generations on what is the importance of a hand and what can each person do to make a difference. And so there were hands that they had to display on their matzah cover and then decorate. So the difference of the, these matzah covers are so beautiful, and they, each one tells a story. These hands are all reaching out. These are the blessing hands. These are the hands that saw Judaism at the core that makes a difference for others. These are the hands on the right hand side, they're telling the story, the Passover story. There's the burning bush, and there's Moses' staff on the left hand side, and the parting of the sea. And these are the hands working together to make a difference. And finally, you see God's hand coming from the sky, but also the hand on earth that is part of this partnership. And for this family, what was at the core was the heart. That when you care for others, 
you can make a difference in what you do. And we're just going to take one moment for one short activity. So I'm going to be passing out a hand, and if you could have one for every other person. And I'd like you to turn to the person next to you and just share what story does that hand tell you. Can I help?
He just ran out of the room. Right. So Danny Larson yes. is the, uh, is the, the, the principal of an organization called Culinary Kids. He uses food to teach Jewish values. He does that here in our school, across right. the city, and across the country. Please welcome Danny Corson. I too have some visual aids in a moment. Very, very quickly, I'll tell you what I do. Culinary Kids Academy is a program that, in a secular environment, teaches math, science, history, but we do it inside of a complex cooking class. In a Jewish environment, we teach Judaic study, uh, but we do that inside of a cooking class. It makes it very personal, it makes it very tangible, and very, very real. And so uh, the kids love it, and they have no idea they're learning because they're having so much fun cooking. So um, I hope uh, I'll be able to provide that to you today. Welcome to Passover Baking 101. I don't know about you, but since I was yay high, anything that passed my lips that was a Passover baked good didn't meet with much success. I didn't like it. And so I found that what most people say is, what do you think matzah tastes like? <laughs> well done. It tastes like cardboard, people. And therefore, anything that's baked with, pass, uh, uh, with matzah is going to taste like. This is what we've been taught all our lives. It's not true. But yet, this is what we're fed. A kichel. Even the name, kichel. <laughs> this, this. I gotta eat this. Yeah. And I love it. If you look over here, it says coach of a Passover all year long. Because <laughs> that's how long it's gonna take for you to be able to eat it. Oh, here's another great one. This, this they bumped the ante. They knew they were, you know, striking out with the kichel. They had to go with the extra moist yellow cake. So what does that mean that tastes like? Wet cardboard. <laughs> you know, I don't know about you, but, but um, uh, charoset has always been taught to me, uh, one of the symbols is the what? Is the bricks and the mortar. Mortar and bricks. I don't know, if you look at that, that doesn't really resemble mortar and bricks in any way. It's sweet, right? It's sweet. Therefore, it's really signifying maybe freedom and not so much mortar and bricks. I think we can do better. That is broader than me. <laughs> look at this. Those are bricks. That's mortar. That is what we're going to use to build a new gymnasium this year. <laughs> what are these? One more time, what are these? Those look good. These do not. <laughs> I am so sorry. I, can, I can't eat one of those. And I will not eat one, one more of those. I, I've been fed every flavor I know to mankind. There's a pistachio macaroon now. And sugar-free, no less. By the way, I forgot to tell you, uh, there is one interesting thing. You see, over 120 years, that doesn't mean that's how long Manish has been around. That's how, that, that's how it tastes. This, when it was made 120 years ago. That's why it tastes like that. <laughs> so what is matzah supposed to taste like? It doesn't, it's not supposed to taste like any of those things. We can actually make it taste really good. It should taste like that. It can taste like that. And it can taste like that. That looks really yummy. And we can make that on Pesach. I've seen it done, I've done it, in the right hands, with the right ingredients, with the right tools, with the right patience and the right love, you can make that. And so my goal today is to say, but go home and have really good Passover baked goods. And I'm gonna teach you right now, very quickly, how to, how to make a killer banana cake. A banana cake that you would eat in August. <laughs> let alone during Pesach. 
It also, you can actually substitute in carrots and make a really great carrot cake as well. I guarantee you, you make this for Pesach, your, your family won't leave that night. They'll be, they'll be, they'll be haunting you for the, uh, the recipe, which I'm going to give you tonight as well. So very, very quickly, in the time we have left, I'm going to show you how to do this. When you make any batter or any kind of, uh, any batter or anything uh, like uh, when you're making a cake, you want to do two bowls, a wet bowl and a dry bowl. What's interesting for this recipe is that we're kind of kind of mix wet and dry. So we're going to start off with oil, right? This is regular vegetable oil. You need to actually have fat uh, uh, in order to be able to uh, hold it together and actually make it taste good. So you can go the no fat route, but I don't care if you're doing that during the year or during Passover, it's not going to taste like this. <laughs> so you got to have some fat in your food. Just don't look, have a piece of cake, don't have seven, right? <laughs> All right, so we're gonna, so we're doing wet, right? So vanilla, you have a choice. You can buy imitation vanilla. I'm going to eyeball this, so it's about two teaspoons of vanilla. So there's one, and there's two. You can buy imitation vanilla, or you can buy real vanilla. I'm, I'm not a fan of anything that says imitation. Oh, by the way, I, mean, I don't know if you also noticed, on the uh, honey cake, it said re imitation honey. Right? I don't know if you've ever bitten, be bitten by an imitation bee. <laughs> it still hurts, right? Exactly. What a bump. It's here all week. All right. So this is where we're going to kind of mix dry with our wet, right? So we're going to mix in two different kinds of sugar. We're going to mix in brown sugar, and we're going to mix in a little white sugar. It doesn't call for a lot, okay? Um, and the reason it doesn't call for a lot is because we're making banana bread. Bananas inherently are sweet. As a matter of fact, I go to the store just to buy brown bananas. I don't know if you see them, they hide them in the back, right? Because everybody, you know, they think, oh my gosh, if I actually show people that we have brown bananas, they're going to think Ralph's, you know, hitting on hard times. So they actually put it in the back for us smart people. Because we go in the back, we get the brown bananas, they have a red band around them, they sell them for 22 cents a pound as opposed to 89 cents a pound. So I don't know about you, but that's a bargain because we use them every day. We, we peel them, freeze them, use them in smoothies, banana bread, banana pancakes, banana cake, you name it. And I can make banana ice cream with two ingredients. That's the most healthy banana ice cream ever. Just take banana, frozen bananas, whip it up, put a little bit of milk. You don't even need that. A little bit of vanilla, you're done. That's banana ice cream, and it's healthy, and it's delicious, but you have to have them frozen. So uh, we'll go with our dry. So this is basically, we're going to actually have six eggs, which are around here somewhere. There they are. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spare you me cracking all of these eggs. I will crack two. And then we're going to go with our dry ingredients. Now, dry ingredients. This is where it gets scary because we can't use flour. Okay, what do we have to use? We have to use matzo. So, look, when you when you cook or when you bake, you're you're using different forms of matzo. It's all the same thing. I don't care whether it's matzo, matzo farfel, matzo meal, matzo cake meal. It's all matzo. It's all the same ingredients. What they've done is they pulverize it. Right? It's different di different forms of matzo. The matzo cake meal is the finest, it's the most powdery, it's the most light flour. And so that's what we use to bake with. When you, when you cook, you might use matzo meal. When you're cooking and you want it, like uh, when you're making a farfel pudding or something like that, you're using matzo farfel, and then those are more whole pieces. So, for instance, you want to save some money, take some matzo, close it up with a matzo farfel. There you go. Right? So, you're going to take this, we're going to take our matzo farfel, uh, uh, we're going to use matzo cake meal, right? And it's very, very powdery. And I'm also going to use potato starch. That's kind of the secret ingredient. Not a lot of people use potato starch. So you're going to use potato starch as well. So you're going to pour that in. Now, what is potato starch? They take the potato, they pulverize it, and they take the starch out, they dry it out, and you have potato starch. It's a really great binder. And, it's, uh, and, and it really doesn't have a whole lot of flavor. But you're basically enhancing the recipe by putting it in because you are creating a, a binding agent. Right? So we're going to have, and, and, and it's, so you're not overloading this with a matzo flavor. So we have our matzo meal, we have cake meal, we have our, our starch. We're going to put in a little bit of salt. Anybody know, I'm going to go off the path here, why do we put salt in sweet things? Anybody know? <laughs> well, well, you're right, it does enhance the flavor, but what does it do? What flavor does it provide? Salt. Very good, excellent. It's counterintuitive, right? You would think we're adding salt because we want it salty, but it's really not the case. 
by adding a trace amount of salt on a pie's taste cookie, muffins, cupcake, every recipe you have at home, check it out. You add like a quarter teaspoon of salt. Why? Because the salt actually brings the sweetness out of the sugar that we just put in here. And so you add too much salt, obviously you're going to be too salty, but you don't want to do that. So you want to stay, stay as much to the recipe as possible. So one thing that I did not take out, and here they are, is my brown bananas. I've mashed these up, okay? And so I'm going to add these into my wet ingredients. And this is what's going to ultimately get incorporated into our dry. I'm going to take a little bit of cinnamon. Calls for about two teaspoons of cinnamon, right? It's a little heavier on the cinnamon. If you don't like a lot of cinnamon, you really don't have to put a tremendous amount in. You can put a teaspoon in. I have no problem with it. Just don't overdo it, right? Uh, and then we're going to put in baking soda. Anybody have a problem with that? Baking soda? It's not supposed to rise, right? right? Is that right? It's not supposed to rise. But it's not really the case. Okay? They have kosher compatible baking soda. Now the reason for that is because it's not about rising. It's not about leavening, right? Why is matzah supposed to take only 18 minutes? After 18 minutes, it's no longer matzah. Why? Because there is fermentation that goes on with the grain when you have it in the oven. As soon as that 18 minutes passes, it's starting to ferment and starting to grow. It's really more about the fermentation than it is about the leavening. Look, we eat things all the time during Pesach that leaven, right? I make a matzah bread that's light and fluffy, right? It rises. We're going to use eggs. Eggs are a natural leavening agent, right? Things rise. It's not so much about the rising as about the, as it's about the fermentation. So you can use baking soda. You can use baking powder. They have kosher for Passover, baking soda and baking powder in kosher markets. I think Supercell definitely has it. Um, so those are our dry ingredients. I am going to quickly mix this. Now, why are we doing them in separate bowls? Because I don't want you to bite into my cake and taste baking soda. I don't want you to bite in and only taste, you know, a grain of salt. I want it all incorporated and all mixed. So this gets mixed together as well. And I'm going to incorporate this in. It's going to start to look very much like a batter, a batter that you recognize, a recognized from any day of the year. But you're going to make sure that it's thick enough. If it's not, it, you can you can toy with it a little bit, not too much. Again, baking is pretty much an exact science. Passover baking is even more an exact science. So you really don't want it, you don't really want to mess with it too much, but you see how thick it is, okay? That's pretty thick, right? So you can make muffins out of this, you can make a cake out of this, you can make a loaf pan out of this. You, I, I did it on sheet trays earlier, uh, about an hour ago, they just came out of the oven. Uh, and so you can put it on any one of those. These are great in the morning, afternoon, and evening. It really doesn't matter, make for a great breakfast. They're super healthy too. Uh, there is a cream cheese frosting recipe that I'm going to give you that goes with both of these recipes. Uh, by the way, for the carrot one, I'm just I'm not taking out the bananas, I'm putting in uh, carrot. Right? That's all. Makes it even, you know, just as healthy. And the sweetness, again, comes from the carrot. So you don't necessarily, look, I'm feeding how many people? So we don't really know. I mean, it's okay to actually add real sugar, real sweetness. Again, we're having one piece, not ten. So uh, these do get incorporated. You put them in your, uh, excuse me, you put them in your, your cake pan, whatever you're baking it off at. 375 degrees, about 15 to 20 minutes later, depending on the size of what you're making. Obviously, if they're muffins, they come out a little bit sooner. You're done. Uh, you definitely got to watch. You don't want to overbake them. And I guarantee you, you'll have this, and you'll say, "Wow, this is." I, my, I made them recently, and uh, for a class. And you know, clearly, it's not Pesach yet. I came home with the uh, leftovers, and my son, who's 16 years old, and uh, started uh, munching away. And about you know, five muffins in, I said, "By the way, you like those?" He said, "Yeah." Great. <laughs> I said, "They coach you a Passover." He said, "No." <laughs> I said, "They are." So this is, this is what you have. Options are available to you. You just don't get bogged down. You know, clearly I'm not a show for men and adults, right? But just don't get bogged down in what we grew up with, right? The, the sky is the limit. Uh, get, uh, get creative. And there are plenty of resources both online uh, for uh, really great recipes and in libraries and, and in bookstores. So uh, we're going to provide you with a sample uh, I made earlier, uh, both uh, banana and carrot, although I just made the banana, but I made the carrot a little bit earlier. It does have the cream cheese frosting on it, and I really thank you for your time. Todd Sinai. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you have.
Shirley can attest. All right, while Danny is passing around samples of the banana cake, let's take a moment and uh, get a little Pesach trivia. Wait, no. A little Pesach trivia. This would be going. Why is baking powder kosher for Pesach? Same thing all. Yes. Just do the video. Well, what makes something hummus? Okay, what do we have? Right? What makes something hummus is very simple. You have a grain, let's say wheat flour, right? Okay. You add water. What happens when you add water to a grain is that the, sh the starch in the grain turns into sugar. And when the starch turns into sugar, it attracts yeast cells that are floating in the air around us all the time. Yeasts love sugar. And they come and they enjoy the sugar. And while they're enjoying the sugar, they become fertile and multiply. And when yeast cells divide, they give off two things. Alcohol and carbon dioxide. That's called fermentation. That's the chemical reaction that is forbidden according to the Pesach rule. So what makes matzah matzah? The grain has been harvested. And from the moment it was harvested until it was brought to the factory, it's been watched and make sure it didn't get wet. In the factory, it's mixed with water within 18 minutes which is the gestation period for one yeast cell, it gets grown into a very hot oven, which kills the yeast cells and keeps the masa flat. And that's what makes something hummus, okay? Now, what is baking powder or baking soda? It's a chemical, okay? Baking soda is sodium bicarbonate, N-A-C-O-2. And baking powder is a, a more complicated one. It's NaCO3, OK? You take NaCO2 or NaCO3, and you add a little water. What happens? The chemical breaks in half, and you end up with chemically induced carbon dioxide, which is OK, because it was a chemical. It wasn't from the fermented, fermented grain. Is that clear? <laughs> so now, you're all, now you're going to understand why you can use so technically, so you, you can then use that as a leavening agent. That's acceptable for Passover. What's not acceptable is the natural fermentation of yeast uh, mixed with grain. OK? Question, yes, please? What about rice? Repeat the question. What about rice? This is a very good reason to marry a Persian Jew. If you didn't have reason before to marry a Persian Jew, let me give you the best reason, besides the fact that Persian Jews are wonderful people, they're excellent Jews, and they know how to cook, right? The Persian custom and the Spartan custom is that rice is okay. Here's the problem. The Talmud tells us that the grains that are forbidden on Pesach, there's seven of them. I can only remember five, right? Wheat, barley, oats, spelt, rye, da dum da dum There's seven of them. It's a list. Now, rice is not included. How come? because they didn't know about rice. Corn is not included because they didn't know about corn. Corn is a North American bed, okay? Rice and corn are both grains. That is, they have the same chemical formula of any grain. They're high in sugars that get released when you add water. Corn, rice are grains. However, because they weren't included in the original list, their status is somewhat iffy, okay? Now, Ashkenazi Jews who don't often eat rice, Ashkenazic rabbis said, no rice and no corn. On Friday night, I pointed out that the basic difference between Ashkenazic and Spartan is, if you have a question and you want the answer to be yes, ask a Spartan rabbi. If you want the answer to be no, ask an Ashkenazic rabbi. So the Ashkenazic rabbi said, no rice and no, grain, no, rice and no corn, because they're both grains. The Sephardic rabbi said, if you take rice out of the diet of Sephardic Jews, particularly out of the diet of Persian Jews, they will starve to death. <laughs> Anyone ever had Shabbos in a Persian home? It's a beautiful experience, except you're going to eat rice with rice and a side of rice, and for dessert, a little rice. So the Sephardic rabbis, especially the Persian rabbi, made a wonderful decision. Anyone here ever heard of Uncle Ben's converted rice? That's what they did. They went, we're this wheat, you're not a grain, you're a vegetable. And they converted rice and turned it into a vegetable. So for one week a year, rice becomes a vegetable, not a grain, and Persian Jews can eat it, but Ashkenazi Jews can't. 
But if you're married to a Persian Jew, which is something I highly recommend, you get to eat rice too. Therefore, what's the difference between Ashkenazim and Sephardim on Pesach? It's very simple. Ashkenazim eat sashimi, and Sephardim eat sushi. And with that, did everybody get a piece of cake? No, you get a piece of cake? Oh, we didn't get cake. 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 Let them eat cake. Two cakes. Two flavors. Everybody get? Right? Tonight, our next presentation is all about the hidden figures in the story of Pesach. Alana Zimmerman, our program director and teacher, as soon as she stuffs a piece of cake in her face, is coming. <laughs> Danny, thank you so you much. You know what? We also. Please welcome Alana Zimmerman. Next year you'll teach this. But uh, as you're listening to these stories, 
I'd like you to think about the qualities that these women, think about how these women see their lives. Think about the qualities that they're emulating that perhaps you would like to take on for yourself in your life. Or perhaps there are people that you know of that embody those qualities, that have that kind of vision that you want to spend more time with because you can really appreciate it. So let's look at uh, the first one, and that's Miriam. Now I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. We're looking at the very first text. Oh, I totally forgot. I was putting out a timer, so I would be on time. How many? That was two seconds, right? Okay. <laughs>
They take all that and the wine. They go out to the fields. They find these apple trees. They wash and bathe their husbands. They serve them fish that makes them thirsty. They drink the wine. And they seduce them. And they become pregnant. And then you see in Song of Songs, it says, who is she that comes up from the desert leaning upon her beloved? Under the apple tree I roused you. It was there your mother conceived you. There she bore you. Song of Songs. Look at the ingredients that you all just said are in your morosis. As Chef Danny would say, just go right to Song of Songs. Nuts, spices, apples, fig trees, pomegranates, it's all there, right? Okay, so those are our Jewish women. Think about, think about how these women saw their life. We know, what, what's the mentality of a slave? What's a slave see? What does a slave feel? about the future of their lives? Anything? No. Remember, how many hundreds of years were we slaves? Right? So their parents, their grandparents were slaves. Like, can they even begin to imagine any kind of a future beyond being a slave? No. But these women, these women had the vision, had the idea. They, were, they had unconstricted sight. Is that what you told me? unconstricted vision. They could see beyond today. They could see the possibilities that existed that slaves couldn't see. And they did whatever it took. Fishes, bathing, whatever it took to make that vision a reality. Okay, those are the Jewish women. Two other stories of women. Uh, flip over. Okay. So, how are we doing? Great. I need a All that fish. Okay. So, Pharaoh said to the midwives, to Shifra and Pua, we know their names, that's pretty cool, like these women are known, said to these midwives, any baby of the Israelite, of the Hebrew women that are born, look at the birth stool, look, right? It says look. And if you see a boy, kill him. If you could well, let her live. What kind of women were these Shifra that were Shifra and Pua? They saw themselves as more than just their job. They were there to assist, bring life into the world. They weren't there to kill these babies. They were answering to a higher calling. They were so clear in the value of what they did that it gave them the courage to defy Pharaoh's decree. When they looked at the birth stool, here's the thing. Imagine, okay, this is genocide. This is Pharaoh is telling them, you can imagine the propaganda, right? What's he saying? They're animals. Their babies don't deserve to live. You can just imagine those kinds of things. They're not human. But Shifra and Pua saw the humanity of these babies. They were able to, oh, to really defy Pharaoh. Not only defy, but they actually challenged him. Because you can see in the text here, when uh, Pharaoh came to them and said, Hey, guys, what are you doing? What is happening here? Look what they said. They said, the midwife said to Pharaoh, because they put the hands back in his face. They said, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous. In the Hebrew, it's like they are like animals. They give birth so fast, we can't just look and tell them that they, were, they delivered a stillborn baby. They deliver too fast. So here, think about these clever Shifra and Pua were able to throw that back in Pharaoh's face. Here's another one, Bacha, the daughter of Pharaoh, who was given the name, her name wasn't there, we she was given the name Batya, the daughter of God, because this is a woman, again, another righteous Gentile. Imagine what it was like growing up in Pharaoh's house. Think about it. Think about what it's like when you have people that you're supposed to revere and respect. 
that are talking to you in a way that just rips your heart out, that is talking about people in ways that just don't work for you, that you, your values are so, so different from this, and that was Bacha. Her values were so different than her father's. And you look here, she went to bathe in the Nile, this little basket comes up with this crying baby, and it says, I mean, seriously, what could possibly be in the basket? I mean, <laughs> hello, she knew. And what's, okay, that means 10 minutes I have. Five left. We're going to go really, really fast. Okay, I'm just putting four. And I actually have an extra minute. Okay, so, right, let's be fair. Um, so look at the, um, we sort of have to look at the Hebrew, but the second line, one, two, three, four, fifth and sixth word. Vatir ehu et hayelet. You know, they always talk about how efficient the Hebrew is. Vatir ehu means, and she saw him. Et hayelet. Well, hello, couldn't she just say she saw the boy or she saw him? Why did she need both? What did Vatya see? What did this daughter of God, who did she really see? Perhaps, are you saying something over there? <laughs> Do you want to answer? Perhaps she saw God. Perhaps she saw, she saw the future of this child. She saw something more. She had a moral clarity that just forced her, to, again, to go again to reverse what her father was preaching to her all the time. Right? Okay, all these great, courageous women. You saw the connection, yes, between the corrosive uh, and the women, right? So, here we are. Uh, at the very last quote we have here. In each and every generation, a person is obligated to see him or herself as if she left Egypt. From the Haggadah, near Ot et Atzmah, you can imagine there could be any verbs there, right? What's another verb? In every generation, someone is should. What? If you didn't say see, someone should feel. Someone should try. Someone should imagine. Someone should pretend. All sorts of things, right? But see, see, what is it that we are being asked to do? How are we supposed to be seen? What are the virtual reality goggles that the crafters, that the stories, the rabbis, our tradition have given us in order to see our world when we are in a situation of bitterness? Bitterness is not to be tasted alone, right? We have to find the sweetness. We never eat more war by itself. Hoboset is the sweetness into which the bitterness is dipped to remind us that our current enslavement is not permanent. The Horosa and the stories of the visionary women remind us to see the potential for a different tomorrow and to taste the sweetness that will come if we pursue it. So look back at this first text. Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, what? Took a tearful in her hand. Everybody else was leaving Egypt. What did they take? Mata. <laughs> Miriam took a timbrel. She knew. She knew there was going to be a time to sing. So, make sure, whatever you do, keep a timbrel in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> or at least in your pocket. For a better Seder. Are you ready? Yes. Count them off with me. Number one. one. My brother-in-law comes to the Seder. He's grouchy. He's grumpy. All he, he asks no four questions. He only has one. When do we eat? So one year I got mad at it and I invented something. I took a kitchen timer. I turned it to one hour. I said, Ricky, this rings, you eat. He was very calm the rest of the morning. The rest of the evening. Because he knew it wasn't going to last forever. Set a time limit. Time with one hour at Seder, hour and a half, whatever it is, set a timer, and clock it 
and as you get close to the end, you'll know when to stop the discussion and move on to dinner. Everyone knows it's a finite amount of time, they're much happier. Number one. Number two. Karpas. Karpas is a green vegetable eaten at the beginning of the Seder to remind us that it's springtime. Karpas has a much more important function in the ancient Seder as well as the contemporary one. It's what you can eat so you don't get hungry during the Seder. So don't serve parsley. The only people who eat parsley are people who eat a Denny's. <laughs> They're better than that. Don't eat parsley. Make a big tray of crunchy vegetables. You live in California, for God's sake. Celery sticks, carrots, potato, boiled potatoes, take them up, peppers of all colors, artichoke hearts, and we dip our carpas into... Because it reminds us of... No, that was that was a, that was a invention of your Hebrew school teacher. We dip our carpas in the salt water because that's the only salad dressing <coughs> poor people can afford. <laughs> but you are rich people, you can afford better. So put in front of your in front of my brother-in-law some salad dressing, some garlic, olive oil, some papanada. I make a yontif guacamole, just like our ancestors ate the land of Mexico. And it keeps him busy because it's lots to eat. And as long as he has left in Ramadan, he's a happy Jew. That's number two. Number three. Listen carefully. This is serious. I'm an ordained rabbi. I studied at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City for many, many years to become a rabbi. I learned many big, obscure books. Nowhere in any of those books does it say you have to drink and a shepherd's. <laughs> the only reason we drank Manischewitz was simple. We came to New York. We were poor immigrant Jews on the Lower East Side of New York. The only grapes that grow in New York are Concord grapes. Concord grapes, if you eat one, they're horrible. They're bitter. So what did our ancestors do? Because they were resourceful, they needed wine. So they made wine out of the Concord grapes, but it was undrinkable, so they dumped a lot of sugar in it. On the Lower East Side, to this day, or rather under the Lower East Side, is Shapiro's Winery. And Shapiro's Winery has a big sign on Eldridge Street. So sweet, you can cut it with a knife. <laughs> that may have been fine for my starving great-grandparents. You can do better. Drink a good wine. The Jewish tradition says you're supposed to have four cups of wine in the Seder. Real cups of wine. Real wine. You can get great kosher wine these days. What we like to do is do an aperitif, a white, a red, and a dessert wine. And that way, everyone has a lovely evening. And besides, if you want to sing those wonderful Sephardic songs, drink four cups of wine. You too will be dancing on the table. Drink good wine. Number four, sing the song. What we did in our house is that after we finished the verses of Dayenu, we go around the table and say Dayenu for everybody. Ilu nata nata lanu nata lanu et shirli. That's true, by the way. Nata lanu et shirli Dayenu. Right? Everyone gets a verse of Dayenu, starting with the old, the youngest and moving to the oldest, which is a lot of fun. That's a sweet way. Sing the, the froggy song. Right? We see the frogs and throw rubber frogs at each other. Right? That's number four. By the way, the best songs are at the end. The Haggadah is at the end. But most Jewish families don't get to the end. So what I'd suggest you do is sing those songs earlier. Yes, you can do that. Okay, what are we up to? Number four? Seven. Number five. Tell the story. <laughs> Ask everyone at the table to bring a story of liberation, freedom, and slavery. Everyone will have such a story. Number six. Use a good Haggadah. If you're still using Maxwell House, you to the last trump, you know, right? You, you can do better than Jason Sanborn and Maxwell House. It's a beautiful Haggadah. And the best thing to do is actually to make your own Haggadah, like Andy's family used to do. You can get lots and lots of materials online. There are lots of supplements around. Put them in a Haggadah. Have people bring stuff to the Haggadah and have a growing, living Haggadah. Number seven. Get to the second half. I was 17 years old before I discovered that the Seder King came when my father unbuckled his belt, reps, and went to sleep. There's actually a second half of the Seder, and the second half of the Seder is all about the Pesach that will yet be. It's all about the Messianic dream to the Jewish people. That's why you invite Elijah into your house, because Elijah is the precursor of Messiah. The second half is about our dreams. The first half is about our history. The second half is about our future. So try to get to the second half. That's number... 
Seven. Number eight. Make the second night different. You don't have to do the same thing the second night that you did the first. For one thing, if you're telling lots of great stories and you get distracted and the ding dings, finish the Seder and then start, pick up where you left off the second night. Because you're on the second night, you might as well use it in a nice way. Or what you can do is the first night, you can have a sort of standard Seder, and the second night, you can have a specialty Seder. My next door neighbor, Ronnie, who's a wonderful edu educator, his, his Seder one year was all about movie clips. He called it the Shankbone Redemption. <laughs> right? And he brought and everybody brought these sort of movie clips that he played on the TV because they were good discussion starters for all of the things that he wanted to do with say. Right? So make sure that it, there's lots of make sure the second night is something memorable, something different than the first night. What are we up to? Nine. I forgot what number nine is. Let's do number ten, <laughs> which is you know how hard you're working preparing the meal, cleaning the house, inviting the guests, setting the table, pouring the wine, setting all this stuff? Take a few minutes and prepare to tell the same story as well. One of the things I like to do is ask everybody at the table, particularly the teenagers, to bring me a song lyric that reflects one of the themes of the Seder. Bring me a song lyric about freedom. Bring me a song lyric or, or, a, or a vignette that you found someplace that reflects your own experience of slavery. Bring me something that says something to you. And if everyone brings something to the Seder, if you prepare it that way, everyone will feel like they're welcome. And the last one is welcome questions. We always have, we have a tradition in our Seder that you can always stop the Seder anywhere you want to ask a question. So we don't stop with four. We have questions all night. My brother, who is a bit of a stubborn person, uh, you've heard of the four sons? I'm number one, he's number two, right? He wants to know, he wants to know, if God is all powerful, why did he get us out after one plague? Why did it take ten? That's a damn good question. And everyone at the Seder table has lots of questions to ask, so invite questions, tell stories, sing songs, drink good wine, use a good agata, make carpas into salad, set a time clock, you'll have a lovely Seder. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my colleague and teacher, Rabbi Noah Clark. House, which is, uh, I guess, one way to celebrate your freedom uh, from slavery is by going and having a jump in the bouncy house. Now, my uh, my topic tonight is uh, is not about bouncy houses or even how to make your seder more engaging. Or it's, I can't cook like uh, Chef Danny. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the beginning of, of the Passover story. You see, well, most of the time when we talk about how we got to where we were. In Egypt, we talk about it in terms of two things. The first is we tell the story of how Jacob went down to Egypt, but he didn't go down there to live, he just went down there to sojourn. If anyone knows that part of the Haggadah, that's definitely part of the story. The other one is that our father was a wandering Aramean who was an idol worshiper and tells the story of how he ends up being uh, expunging idol worship when we became monotheists. So those are two beginning of the story, but neither of those are in the book of Exodus, interestingly enough. In the book of Exodus, it begins with a list of names, and then right after, we find this quote. It says, we became a great and powerful nation. The Pharaoh says to the people, let us deal shrewdly with them, so that they may not increase. Otherwise, in the event of war, they may join our enemies in fighting against us and rise from the ground. Pharaoh decides that there's something wrong with the Jewish people. Been slaves now for 400 years. He decides suddenly that there is something wrong with us. We don't look exactly like Egyptians. We don't talk exactly like Egyptians. But we need to somehow be uh, pushed down by the regime. And so what Pharaoh does is, in the word he actually is nidhamata, which means to deal shrewdly with someone. The word chacham, you might hear that in the text. So how does Pharaoh begin to oppress the Israelites in Egypt? According to the rabbis, it's not that Pharaoh 
came with an army and suddenly took away all of the rights, all of the privileges of living in the land of Goshen. No, according to the rabbis, it was one small diminishment at a time. One small indignity at a time. He normalized the nation against the Israelites, began to levy special taxes on them, began to require certain types of clothing, began to take away land rights, and the next thing you know, they're slaves. And the question the rabbis ask simply is, how is it that the Israelites let this happen? How is it that the Israelites let slavery creep up on them, become so sneaky, and get inside of them where they became a slave? Now the story is from a different perspective, from a different time, about slavery in this country. It's not a story where slavery snuck up on uh, African Americans. They were kidnapped from Africa, brought across the world to the bottom of ships, and then dumped off in, first in the Caribbean and eventually in this country and been enslaved for hundreds of years. That's true. So it didn't sneak up on them. But there is something about the mentality of being a slave that the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass once said. He said, I have found that to make a contented slave it is necessary to make a thoughtless slave. It is necessary to darken his moral and mental vision, and as far as possible to annihilate the power of reason. He must be able to detect no inconsistencies in slavery. He must be made to feel that slavery is right. And he can be brought to that only when he ceases to be a man. The idea of slavery is simply this, is that it is an environment and an ecosystem which the slave, him or herself, ceases to have a personal identity. Where they are shrouded in darkness and they believe that the world as it is, a world in which they are born into slavery, work their entire lives and die a slave, is the way, the righteous way of being. The right way of being. Aristotle, in his book on politics, talks about the four levels of society. He says, a slave will always be a slave, and a nobleman will always be a nobleman. And there's something cosmological, there's something tapped into the fabric of the universe that says that these strata are meant to be the way they are. But we know that's not true. We know that that is a social construction. We know that slavery can cloud the mind and sneak up on it. Pharaoh's most amazing trick was to make the Israelite who became a slave feel that slavery was right. As Frederick Douglass once said, slaves are generally expected to sing as well as to work. That they were content in their slavery because they sang while they worked. Now, I do a lot of work with people who feel like this. Who feel enslaved feel thrown out on the streets. I was talking to a woman who was formerly homeless, and she says, it didn't happen all at once. It didn't happen where I was kicked out all at once. It happened where I first couldn't make rent, and then I got to sleep on a friend's couch or in a guest room, and then I overstayed my welcome, and I went and stayed with another person, and then I, then I was in my van because no one would take me in anymore. And then my van got me the best, and I ended up on the street. And I ended up on the street, and as a woman, that's a very difficult situation, living in fear. But she says, you know what the worst of it was? Is that it's like society forgot who I was. I became part of the landscape. I became part of the environment. No one would even look me in the face or say hello. And there became a part of my life where my entire identity was erased. And I forgot who I was. Where I forgot who I was. I had no individual hope, no individual self, no individual feeling of who I was. If I looked in the mirror, I would see a ghost because no one would acknowledge my existence. And the same was true with the Israelites. This condition that Douglas talks about so passionately, this condition that is described by those who live at the margin of being forgotten by society 
This condition we find right in the beginning of the Passover Seder and Passover story. Because what Pharaoh had done is he had internalized the tyranny of the regime into the heart of the state. Rabbi Nachman of Rothschild teaches it this way. He says, the word Pharaoh, which you see up here, Pei Rejai Pei, can be rejumbled around to be Parua. The word Parua, Para, or Parua in Hebrew means something that is wild. Imagination, something that is internal, a psychological uh, imagining, a psychological uh, tick in your brain, in your heart. A psychological tick that says you're not part of humanity. A psychological tick that says I just want to be better than I am. I just want to be more perfect. I just want to work a few more hours. I just want to uh, you know, make a few more dollars, and it's okay if I miss the baseball game, and it's okay if I miss the anniversary, and it's okay if I uh, go on a bad diet, because I'm just imagining myself to be captivated to look like someone or feel like someone else. Pharaoh becomes not external, but internal. And when you internalize Pharaoh, it's when you become a slave. It's talking about the Israelites. They literally became slaves. They became slaves so much they lost their entire identity. Alana was talking about how the women saved us from that. I'm going to talk about the condition itself. Now, for us today, for us today, it doesn't necessarily mean that we feel enslaved from without. Sometimes we feel enslaved to our own passions, our own ambitions, our own feeling of looking at the world and saying, I'm not perfect, and then therefore I'm not good enough. Pharaoh becomes parua, becomes an internalized, an un undercover dictator, telling us how to be, how to think, and what to feel. Now the Israelites, their identity was completely decimated. In a book that is called Shmot, in a book that is all about names of the people who went down to Israel, at the beginning of the Exodus story, we find this word. It says, A certain man of the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw how beautiful he was, she hid him for three months. She put the child into the basket and placed it amongst the reeds by the bank of the Nile. In a book that is all about names, about identifying who went down to Egypt at the beginning of the Seder, the beginning of the Exodus story, Moses, Hebed and Aram, their names are missing. They have no identity. A certain man, a certain woman, a child, there are no more names. They have learned to sing while they worked. They have learned to internalize Pharaoh. There is nothing there. There is nothing left. And it's only into that environment does the Exodus story show us how low we can go before we get on the road to redemption? So, that's where the Exodus begins. It begins with the internalization of the tyranny of slavery, where someone loses their hope, loses their identity, loses their sense of being. And only then do they begin to be drawn out of that space. This isn't a lecture about the ten plagues, but I'll tell you the ten plagues, part of the purpose was to reposition their identity. Think of the plague of darkness, for example. The plague of darkness fell onto the Egyptians. It wasn't a darkness where it was just kind of like someone turned the lights out. It was a darkness that literally says that one person couldn't see the other. What the plague of darkness did was it showed the Egyptians what it's like to lose your identity. You feel alone in the world, where people pass you by and don't even give you a glance or say hello. When I was talking with this woman that was formerly homeless, she said the moment that her life changed was when a social worker reached out to her and just said, hello, what's your name? What's your name? And from there, she was able to reach into the darkness, into the chaos of her life, and slowly pull her out getting her off drugs, getting her a place to live, 
And now she is a productive member of society. In fact, she advocates on behalf of the homeless across this city because she found her identity in that. So the question is now that you're sitting in your Passover table, I want you to ask the question, where is Pharaoh living inside of you? Pharaoh is gone, and we are here. But where is Pharaoh still parua inside of you? What are the parts of your life that you suddenly realize that you are enslaved to? And how do you wake up to your own slavery? Find your own identity. Become the person you've always dreamed of becoming. And then, of course, you can't end the Passover Seder. You can't end Passover without bringing the Exodus with you out. After the meal is over, after the eight days of being with your family and friends are over, you go back into the world and you open the door and say, well, now what is my responsibility to outstretch my arm and with a strong hand make those who are still enslaved free? So those are the last questions of the Passover Seder, is that you can take us out of Egypt. But how do you take Egypt out of us? You can take Pharaoh away from a political situation, but how do you take Pharaoh out from your heart? And how do you do that for other people? Thank you very much. Well, tonight you've had carrot cake, you've had Spartak song, you've had Frederick Douglass, you've had the women of the Exodus, you figured out how your hand works, you know how to bring little kids to the Seder, um, it's a lot of stuff for one night. It's a lot of stuff. So let's say thank you to all of our presenters. <laughs> very special thank you to Alana Zimmerman for all of her work. <laughs> uh, very special thank you to Louise Spitzer, as always, for her kindness and her hospitality. To all those who presented tonight, thank you. Yeah. Right? Um, and thank you for coming. Let me wish you one, one last thing before you split. Call you before you do Exodus. You know? um, at the end of the at the end of the first half of the Seder, there's a statement by Rabban Gamliel, who is the great Nasi, the great leader of the rabbinic community that created the Seder. And he says, "Whoever doesn't say these three things has missed his obligation." Which means, in order to finish the Seder, you've got to talk about three things, right? Remember what they are: Pesach, Matzah, Maror. Right? Now, ironically, those are the three answers to, four of the, to the four questions, right? Originally, the first question was, on all of the nights we eat pizza, pasta, pickles, tonight we're only eating matzah. So you got to explain matzah. On all other nights we eat all kinds of vegetables. Tonight you're making us eat bitter vegetables. That's moral. The third question, the original version of the third question, which we don't have anymore, was on all of the nights we eat all kinds of meats, tonight only roast lamb. That's got to be the Pesach, Pesach Matzah Maru. Those are the three answers to the questions. So just let me ask you quickly, Matzah, what's the meaning of Matzah? What's the meaning of Matzah? I know it's unleavened bread, right, but what, what's the meat? why do we eat Matzah? Why do we eat Matzah? Just raise your hand, let me hear something. Someone give me, yes, yes, sorry? All right, so there's one answer which is given at the end of the Seder, and ironically, a different answer is given at the beginning. At the beginning of the Seder, you say, in Aramaic, Rabbi, Allah ma'anya ba'aflo abatana ba'ara de Mitzrayim. This is the poor bread which our ancestors ate when they were slaves. At the beginning of the Seder, the matzah is slave food. At the end of the Seder, it means what? We were rushing from slavery and didn't have a chance to stop at the bakery, didn't have a chance to let the bread rise, so we took this matzah. At the end of the Seder, the very same symbol has the exact opposite meaning. It now represents the bread of freedom. At the beginning of the Seder, it's the bread of slaves. At the end of the Seder, it's the bread of freedom. Okay? Number two, maror. Let's say it better than Mara. Karose. At the beginning of the Seder, what is Karose? It's the mortar which we used as slaves to build the cities of Pharaoh. How are you going to use Karose at the end of the Seder? You're going to have to eat Maror. But you're not allowed to eat Maror alone. 
It has to be eaten with the aroset so that the bitter is now sweet. That was Alana's wonderful observation. The bitter is now sweet. It's first it was the tool of slaves, and then it's the sweetness of liberation. Same symbol, two very different meanings. All right, one more. Pesach, the Pesach of sacrifice. At the beginning of the Seder, what is it? Moses told us, take a lamb, slaughter the lamb, smear the blood all over your door. Why? Because the angel of death is... And by the way, if Santa Claus can find the houses of good Christian children, <laughs> why does the angel of death need my blood on the wall? <laughs> and come on, the angel of death has got to be at least as smart as Santa Claus. You better not cry. You better not shout. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. The angel of death is coming to town. <laughs> That's exactly what it is at the beginning of the Seder. At the beginning of the Seder, the Pesach represents this tiny film of protection from something which is utterly frightening. Sudden, horrid, infant. What is the Pesach at the end of this day? It's the sacrifice that we bring to celebrate that we are now free people. You have a doubling of the meaning of all of the symbols. In one moment, they represent the experience of Egypt. And in the other moment, they represent the experience of liberation. And that's the, the narrative arc of the story. The story teaches two truths. Number one, there's evil in the world. Don't be naive. Pharaoh is real. Evil is real. Slavery is real. Suffering is real. There is evil in the world. Don't be naive. Understand the kind of world we live in. Don't close your eyes to it. Don't pretend it's not there. Don't pretend it belongs to somebody else. It's you. You have to remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Because you have to know that suffering belongs to us all. That it's part of the social experience in this world. That's truth number one. That's matzah as slave bread, karoset as mortar, and pesach as the tiny film that keeps you from utter chaos. And then, what's the other answer? We cross, the, we, cross we, we leave Egypt, we cross the Red Sea, and on the other side of the Red Sea, Miriam leads us in a dance. Because the other truth is liberation, redemption, Liberation and redemption is possible. Do not be a cynic. To be a cynic, to give up, to give up hope, to give up vision, to give up the sense of responsibility, is to give up your identity as a Jew. To give up and say, Pharaoh's right, what is, is what has to be, and it will never change, that's apostasy. That's idolatry. That is what Rabbi Farkas taught us. That's the slavery of the mind. The slave believes the world can never change. The slave believes that what is is what is inevitable and it can never be different. The slave has given up. It is the ultimate form of despair, in some ways the ultimate form of cynicism, to say it can never change. But you and I, we cross the sea. We still have mud at the bottom of our shoes. We cross the sea, and because we cross the sea, we know it can be different. Salvation, liberation, redemption can all change the world, and it's a very real possibility in our lives. So matzah, which was the slave, the bread of slaves, becomes the food of redemption. Tomorrow and haroset, which was the bitterness of slavery and the brutality of the mortar, becomes the sweet relish which drowns out the bitterness of history. And Pesach, which was this little bit of blood on the door, protecting us from the horror of the chaos of death, becomes our meal of liberation, our feast of celebration, the beginning of a new day. That is the definition of Jewishness. And that's why this is the holiday for Jewish people. We live in a in a world filled with, with brokenness, we know that. And we carry a sense of responsibility with it, with, about it. But we know that there's a possibility of redemption. And that's the ultimate faith of
of the Jewish people. Dr. Coleman. Yes, I have a question. I was on a high. You just, uh, you know, <laughs> well, I want to, want to know why, after we do this two days, yeah. why, does, why is it over? Why is it what? Why is it over? Why isn't it over? Right. What's why not over? Celebrate it's celebrate over. It for a week. Why do you celebrate it for a week? Yeah. Because you have all these leftovers you got to eat. I think you can make all that much. You got to be how to make you have to eat all these leftovers. There's lots of sheets over here. Awesome. Please take some. Go ahead. And there's lots of. Go ahead. Oh, I just want you all to know that thank you to Chance. We've been live streaming this to anybody who wants to watch it over the course of the evening. Apparently, there have been like 60 to 70 people that have tuned in throughout the night. If you have Facebook, if there is something that you heard tonight that you want to share with a friend, it will be available. So, and if you I, fell asleep during the presentation, <laughs> that will be available too. And uh, call the temple and talk to someone other than me that can explain that to you. Have a wonderful hog. Have a wonderful holiday. Hug